Hi friends, just a really quick study of how the book of Revelation shows us that the rapture of the church happens before the 70th week of Daniel, as we read about in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. So here we see that the beginning of the book tells us that this book is for the bondservants of Jesus Christ. It is to tell us things which must soon take place. It came through John and that the time is near. We also read that we are blessed if we read or hear the words of this prophecy. So this is the only book in the Bible that promises us a blessing if we read it or even hear it read out loud. So you and I are in for a blessing at this time. Okay, we see also that it's directed to the seven churches that are in Asia. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, we see in verse 12 that the very first thing that John sees in his vision are the seven golden lampstands, which we read in verse 20, are the seven churches. So the first thing he sees is the church, and then he sees one like a son of man. He sees Jesus described in verses 13 through 19. We also know from verse 19 that these are not all past tense things as um, the doctrine of preterism would claim that these things were present, past, and future for John. And with Revelation having been written in sometime between 90 to 96 AD, we know that this book does not contain just past tense events. We know that John was told after the destruction of the temple, which was in 70, over 20 years after the destruction of the temple and the ransacking of Jerusalem, that he was going to be shown things that were and are and will take place. So past, present, and future is what John got to see. And therefore, you and I are also being told a revelation, a revelation of things that are to come. Uh, again, because the time, the time is near. So if it had all been past when John got this revelation, it wouldn't have said the time is near. It would have said, the time, you know, wasn't too long ago, but it's talking about it in the future. And again, things which must soon take place. They haven't taken place yet. And soon to the Lord again, with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. So just because it took 2000 years for us to start seeing all of this um, ramp up and begin to, you know, show some birth pains, doesn't mean anything to the Lord. 2,000 years is evidence of his patience. Now, in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, we see the seven letters that Jesus dictated to John to share with the seven churches. And these are seven actual geographical churches in Asia. But they're also a picture of the church over the course of the church age. So the church through time, 2,000 years of church history. And as we see that we're looking at the church through the course of time, we see that the last church at the end, the church of Laodicea, toward the end of the church age, is the lukewarm church. And aren't we, though? Don't you see lawlessness coming, creeping into the church, worldliness creeping into the church, false doctrines and uh, apostasy? We see tons and tons of apostasy, heretical teachings, and just... Um, loving sin and inviting sin into the church. We also see Jesus has been kicked out. He says, hello, I'm at the door. Will you open it? Can I come back into the church? Because the church has literally kicked Jesus out. That's why this is the last church. That's why it's the last part of the church age, because at this point, the saturation of sin in our world is complete. Then, starting with chapter 4, we see that John is told, come up here. And he goes to heaven. He's in the spirit. He sees the throne. He sees the Lord. And he sees 24 elders. Those 24 elders are more evidence that the church is already present in heaven right after the church age and before anything else happens. So it's after these things, after what things? After the church age. Then John is in heaven, and so are the 24 elders. And not only are they in heaven, they're already clothed in their wedding garments, their white garments, and they have their crowns on their heads. So they've also been to the crowning ceremony. 
They've already received their rewards. So here they are before the throne, the church in general, but represented here by the elders. The church is there, okay? And everyone is praising God. Then we see the book comes out. It's sealed. It, pardon me. It's sealed with seven seals. None of them have been opened. And John is weeping because no one is worthy to open the seals. And of course, then we see the lion from the tribe of Judah, Jesus, our Savior, is the one who is worthy. So there we are looking at that. And everyone is, is again, praising the Lord and um, talking about how he has rescued us and made us to be a kingdom and priests and we are there to watch this because you know this is glorifying to the lord that's why he wants us there at the time when he begins breaking the seals this is all glorifying to the lord then we see he starts breaking them and we begin to see in the seals themselves that all of this is happening um in from heaven we see that the lord has us in heaven as the tribulation unfolds on the earth, as the 70th week of Daniel or the day of Jacob's trouble is unfolding on the earth. We see the first seal is broken and we see the Antichrist going out conquering and to conquer. He was given some time. Satan knows his time is short. He's not given a whole lot of time, but he's given some time to conquer and to conquer. And this is a form of judgment because the Lord says, you know, you didn't accept my son. Let's see how you like this guy. No, we're not there for that because we're not appointed to wrath. The second seal shows us a red horse and peace is taken from the earth. Now, is this possible if the church is on earth? The church is the followers of Jesus Christ indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And we are peacemakers. So how can you remove all peace from the earth? If the peacemakers are here, you can't. You can't take peace from the earth. Maybe you can take some of it, but not all of it. And what would be the purpose of having the church here? The Lord doesn't need the church here for this. He has 144,000 people and angels and two witnesses, you know, in the book of Revelation. He doesn't need for for you and I to be bloodied and killed uh, for, for him to judge the earth. No, no. And we're not appointed to wrath. Then in the third seal, we see a black horse and famine. And... um. Everything is so expensive that nobody can afford to eat. That's another form of judgment. We're not appointed to judgment. Then we see an ashen horse. Some versions say a green horse. And so these four colors, by the way, um, white and red and black and green are the same four colors that are used in most of the flags for um, the Arab nations, for Muslim nations. That's just interesting to me. This fourth horse kills a fourth of the earth. That is wrath. That is judgment. And we are not appointed. He kills a fourth of the earth. So if it happened right this moment, that would be almost 2 billion people. That's another way that we know that the tribulation has not started. Obviously, we've never seen death on that scale. And we see four ways that he's going to kill them. Sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts. Okay, remember that. Sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts. Now here's more proof that um, that this is all this is all the judgment of the Lord. This is all the wrath of the Lord. We go to Ezekiel chapter 14. We start with verse 21 and look at what we see. The Lord God is talking here and he says, How much more when I send my four severe judgments against Jerusalem? And what are those four severe judgments? Sword, famine wild beasts, and plague, pestilence, same thing, sword, famine, wild beasts, and plague, pestilence. Whose judgments are they? The Lord says, these are my judgments, my four severe judgments, sword, famine, wild beasts, and plague. So go back again to Revelation and chapter 6. And with the fourth seal, the green horse, the pale horse, same four. Sword, famine, wild beasts, pestilence, plague. Whose judgments are they? The Lord's judgments. Whose wrath is this? The Lord's wrath. Look here. 
the great day of their wrath has come. Now, day doesn't mean 24 hours in this context. It means period. The time of their wrath has come. Who's able to stand? And who's going to stand? Nobody. Nobody's going to stand. That's why you have to come to Jesus now. If you haven't come to Jesus, well, that's just inviting trouble. It's inviting trouble because it says here, you know, that 2 billion people are going to die if it were to happen right now. They're, they're going to die with this fourth horse, you know. And then when you, you see the fifth seal break, we see all those people who've been killed in the tribulation. They've been slain because they, they didn't reject the word of God now. So, you know, it took them a hot minute. But they finally came around and they bore testimony. They did not worship the beast. They did not take his mark. Okay. Revelation chapter 13 says, don't worship the beast. Don't take his mark or you can't be saved. So, and then, you know, it gets worse and worse, you know, because we see these people are in their spirits in heaven. They haven't gotten their glorified bodies the way that we have during the rapture. We get our glorified bodies, superhero body, bodies, just like Jesus's body, as we read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 52, maybe. It tells us that we won't all sleep, but we'll all be changed. We'll be transformed in the blink of an eye. Those who are alive and remaining, 1 Thessalonians um, 4, those who are alive and remaining, we won't precede those who've fallen asleep in Christ. So the dead in Christ will rise and then we'll meet the Lord and them in the air and we will be with the Lord forever. Don't you want to do that instead of being killed by all these seals? And then you have an earthquake and, and more people are, are dying and things get super scary with the sky being split apart. So don't be here for that. Come to Jesus now. He loves you. He tells a parable in the New Testament about how the king threw a banquet and when a bunch of people who were invited rejected their invitation to the banquet, that he said, go into the highways and the byways and bring in everyone that you find there, both good and bad. So are you bad? He still loves you. He wants you to join him for this banquet. He wants you to join him. He doesn't want to kill you. He doesn't want all this stuff to happen to you. So please be smart and, and do the smart thing. Okay. Now, if you for some reason miss the rapture, then we read here in verses 9 through 14 of chapter 7 that the number of people who will be saved during that time will be so great that they literally cannot be counted. So there is hope. You just must be true to Jesus at that point. And I hope that doesn't happen to you. I, I don't want it to happen to you. I believe the Lord doesn't want it to happen to you. That's why he's given you all this information. So what to do now? Run to Jesus. Know that the time is near. Read your Bible, especially this book that promises a blessing to everyone who reads it or even hears it. And run to Jesus. He loves you. He wants both good and bad good and bad, to come and join him for the feast. Okay, I hope to meet you in the air soon. Jesus loves you and so do I. God bless you. Bye.